So when you're thinking, are you thinking in English or are you just thinking? Well, I think it's hard to say. I mean, you you could answer this as well as I could. Are all thoughts obviously not all, not all thoughts are worded, I guess. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Today we are going to take on an email that we got from one of our listeners, our listener Adam, who emailed, thinking way back to episode two about languages, when we talked about my lack of Italian and Tiffany's proficiency in Italian. The question was, language versus the brain. First in question being, do I think in English or do I just think, if English is my lang- native language? And then another question being, what are the pluses and minuses of knowing two languages really, really well? And then the third question, which is mainly for you, Tiffany, as a fluent Italian speaker, which of the two languages is better, English or Italian, and which is the most descriptive? So we're going to try to take those on today. Ooh, a lot of exciting questions. I like it. I know. Thank you, Adam. And if you have a question that you want us to answer, send us an email, bittersweetlife at mail.com. Bittersweetlife at mail, M-A-I-L dot com. All right. So let's just start at the beginning of his questions in the languages versus the brain episode, which is, let's all think back to our native language, English, <laughs> the one I speak the best and the one you also speak the best. I should hope so. So when you're thinking, are you thinking in English or are you just thinking? Well, I think it's hard to say. I mean, you you could answer this as well as I could. Are all thoughts, obviously not, not all thoughts are worded, I guess. Because, I mean, before you know how to speak, you are thinking clearly. So I guess not. I mean, I don't think I'm hungry is always going to come out in a word form. But other things definitely do. I don't know. What do you think? It's a hard question because I think... A lot of the time when you're thinking in your head, it depends on, I guess, what you're thinking about. If if you're thinking in your head, oh, here's something I should have done. This is the conversation I should have had with this person. And I think a lot of our thinking in our head is that way. If I had that moment to do over again, I would have done this. Or I'm going to write that letter to a prospective employer tomorrow. Perhaps I'll say this. What else should I add? And that's all obviously thinking in English. Mm-hmm. Retracing old conversations or... Sometimes, even when you're thinking, you're thinking in stories, making things up as you walk along. Particularly when you're in Rome, you see a tower next to a bridge, and you think to yourself, oh, I wonder what that face in the tower is there for, and what a kind of a story could I build out of that? And then you start your imagination going, and I don't know, when it gets into that realm, are you thinking in pictures, or are you thinking in English language. And perhaps I'm, I'm pulling an idea that you have for a story as my example, which is unfair. But, no, um, it's fine. It's <laughs> but, and it's very vague, so you'll have to go a little farther. But in that case, then you get more into uh, pictures and feelings, which maybe if we were trying to describe what we were doing today would end up in English, but aren't in English at the time. Oh, these are a lot of interesting thoughts that I can't, I, you know, I'd actually have to think, sit and think about this. As a writer, me personally, I think I'm pretty wordy. I think more with words than with images. I am a visual person too, but I can't recreate that. I have no visual artistic skills whatsoever. But as far as my thoughts, I think they were, I would say that way more are in words than in pictures. I would guess that the majority of the thoughts, unverbalized thoughts that I have, or nonverbal, I guess is the word, would be basic instincts, hunger, fear, anger, feelings, things like that. I don't think when I'm thinking about a story, I mean, obviously there are images come up, but definitely no, I'm going to be thinking in words for sure. Well, if it comes up to where fear, say, something that comes upon you, you're walking down a street, it's dark outside, you see a man approaching you that you can't quite make out who seems four times your size, and you have a fear instinct, do you think in your head, I've got to get away from him? or get away from me, or do you just cross to the other side of the street? I don't know. What do you do? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it depends on how much time you have. I think if it's a 
fight or flight instinct, I don't think any words are going through your head. You run, you scream, you don't have time to think about it. But I think if you are maybe in a slightly less dangerous situation, maybe the guy's like a block and a half away, maybe there's a few other people around, you might say, think to yourself, who is that? That guy's huge or whatever. That guy looks is looking at me menacingly. Maybe a way to think about it is to think about dreaming. There are two ways we could think about this, actually, but let's start with dreaming. Do you think that you dream in English or in pictures? I think I dream in mostly in language because I have had dreams in Italian, and I remember that they happened in Italian, or at least that dialogue was happening in Italian. Maybe it wasn't my thoughts. Maybe I was saying something in Italian. And just for the record, I do usually dream in English. But occasionally I'll dream in Italian, and I can usually remember when that happens. So... I don't know, but maybe, like I said, maybe it's just the dialogue and maybe the actions are pictures. This is getting seriously intense. Oh, I have another question for you now that just popped into my head. So Did it pop it in verbal form or nonverbal form? <laughs> it came in in verbal form, as a matter of fact, because I had to figure out how I was going to police the question to you. <laughs> but no, the question is, since you are married to an Italian man and you spent the majority of your relationship with him speaking in Italian, when you dream about him, are you speaking in English or Italian? <laughs> I can't remember, but I would assume Italian. I know that sounds silly and vague that I can't remember, but maybe I don't dream about him very often. I see him enough when I'm awake. <laughs> well, another question is, since you're fluent in both languages, is obviously if language is coming into my head while I'm walking down the street and I'm thinking about the letter I'm going to write or I'm thinking about what I should have said, it's going to be in English. But for you, do you find that you're thinking in Italian? Sometimes. I noticed it the first time when I wasn't even living here yet. I was just studying here for one month. But I was already practicing Italian a lot, and I was very interested in being able to speak it. I wasn't fluent yet, but I spoke it pretty proficiently. And I was probably just getting ready for the day, and a thought came into my head. And I sometimes talk out loud when I'm alone. Sometimes even when I'm out in public, I try not to, but it happens. And I said something to myself in Italian. Oh, where did I put my keys or something? And I stopped. I thought to myself, I just thought in Italian. And that was the first time that I ever remember thinking in Italian. And that was, as I said, before I lived here. So it happens to me a lot now that I think in Italian, especially if I'm doing something, like if I've just been speaking Italian. So if I'm at work and I've been speaking to my colleagues in Italian, it's very likely that a thought will pop into my head in Italian or if I've just been speaking to my husband the same. But since I'm over here with you now, the thoughts are definitely going to come in English. Well, I could also point out that Tiffany from time to time when she's talking to me will start speaking in Italian and then will remember that she's with me and switch to English. Now, before, wait, <laughs> I think that that's only happened on the phone. No, no. It happened just the other day when we were out. And we remember we went to see that live performance of the reenactment of the death of Caesar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you started speaking to me in Italian in the crowd. Ah, that's right. That's right. I did. OK, I, I didn't remember that. But yeah, it, it's pretty rare, though. Come on. Well, rare enough. But anyway, should we move on to the next question? We yes. should call an expert. I should call an expert and ask that question. <laughs> If whether or not you think in English, what do you think? I would uh, listen or if you're when you're listening, what do you think? What pops into your head? I'd be interested to hear what other people had to say. What are the plus and minuses of knowing two languages? Well, what do you think? I mean, how's your Italian getting? It's are pretty you? bad still. Oh, come on. It's got to be better. Uh, it's better. <laughs> I mean, when we first talked about language uh, several months ago, yes, at least a few months ago, it was now. Quite a while ago, yes. What has been your progress since then? Uh, my progress is probably not as far as it should be because I keep getting wrapped up in other things and not working on it as hard as I should. That said, my comprehension is pretty good. Not across the board, but generally speaking, I can kind of suss out what people are asking me. My ability to recall what I should say in response to them is still pretty poor. I'm still having trouble jumping to Spanish first because those words I that's learned in normal. high school that's totally normal um, or using a combination thereof which we've talked about before when we talked about the electricity being cut how I was talking in Spanish and Italian to that guy 
but generally speaking, full sentences are still really hard for me. So while I, I feel like I know more what's going on around me and I can have longer sustained interactions with the grocery store clerk, I would still never take credit for actually knowing two languages. I mean, I'm more familiar with Italian than somebody who's never been to Italy or has never known anybody who spoke Italian, but I well, still I would not say so. <laughs> I still would not say I'm at all fluent or even proficient. Well, maybe this will be just a big head start. So in your future life, and I know you're not always going to live here, sadly for me, but you could, if you want, I mean, maybe you could care less, but if you want, you could, this is a nice head start that you have that most people, when they start to learn a new language, don't have, that you've been hearing it day after day. It's been going in. You might not notice that it's going in, but it is going in. It's getting in there. And so it definitely, like a little child, who hears a language and doesn't understand it at first, it's nevertheless going in and you are absorbing it. So, yes. And I, my pronunciation of words is better as far as reading it. If nothing else, now when novels are set in Italy, I won't just glaze over the words that I can't pronounce. I'll actually be able to be like ragazzi or something like this. Fantastic. Yes. So that said, though, what would you say... We've talked a little bit in the language show episode two that we did um, about the pluses of knowing two languages. But what would you say is the minus, the bad part about knowing two languages? I feel that sometimes I start to forget my words in my native language. And I have to sit and think about them more. It is a problem as a writer. It definitely comes up. And there have been times when there's a really simple word and I can't think. No, I'm not saying that I... Sometimes I can think of the Italian for the word. That does happen. But sometimes I can't think of either. I think the word I was looking for was suspicious one day. I couldn't think of the word suspicious. And I actually had to look up. I had to go to thesaurus.com and look up the antonym of trustworthy. They say that little kids, when they learn two languages simultaneously, they speak much later. And then, of course, they catch up and it's fine after that and their brains are better for it. I do think that there must be something to that, and I feel sometimes at, at a loss for words. And one time recently, I was working on something, I was writing something in English, and I couldn't think of the word for if you're looking through a book and you're just sort of slowly turning the pages. Like, what, wh what is that word? And I could think of it in Italian. What is that word? <laughs> Sfogliare. And it means to leaf through, and it comes from the word foglia, which means leaf in Italian. And so the, the word actually is the same in English, to leaf, but I could think of it in Italian. I couldn't think of it in English. So maybe that is, is a detriment to speaking two languages. That's the only thing that comes to my mind off the top of my head. If I think of something else, I'll, I'll mention it. How much of that is just getting older? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I say that as a pity to myself. Sometimes I'll be mid-conversation and then I'll think, wait, what's the word for... And I was a writing major in college and... I work on the radio, <laughs> and when you can't think of words, that's a whole nother matter, especially in the moment. So maybe you'll never be able to go into radio. That's very likely, <laughs> considering this podcast. <laughs> no. But you also are, um, you are a writer, and you make your living as a writer solely, so it can't be too bad of a detriment. No, no, I don't think so. But luckily, writing, as opposed to radio, you, you do have time to look for those words. That's true. I'm also a very poor speller, so oftentimes when I'm writing, I have more of the trouble of knowing a really big word that I want to use, but cannot figure out how to spell it. And the spell check will be like, no, no, <laughs> that's not it. Nope. And so you'll be like, okay, let's see, you know, try it a different way. No, no. And then finally, you just have to choose a different word. <laughs> you couldn't just get out a dictionary? I could. But if you don't know how to spell it, where do you begin? Does it start with E, A, True. I? Well, see, let me just pause in our language discussion to talk about something very particular to English. Now, I don't know if this also pertains to other languages. I imagine that it might, but it doesn't really apply to Italian, and I would guess Spanish as well. The idea of not being able to spell a word in your native language to an Italian is very strange because Italian is spoken exactly the way that it's written. So if you know the basic rules of pronunciation, you should know how to spell every single word. And I was talking actually with a colleague and she was kind of laughing and deriding me that I said, oh, I can't remember how to spell this word in English. And she said, how can you not spell a word in your own language? 
like I was some kind of idiot. Did you punch her in the face at that point? I really wanted to. No, but I said it's very difficult because here's a word that I always struggled with as a kid. And I think something like 15, I just forced myself. I just made up some mnemonic device that I could memorize it. And the word is necessary. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Necessary is terrible because there are those two sibilants, those two S sounds. And it could be an S, it could be a C, it could be a double S. Might not be a, a double C. I don't think that works. But, and which is which? And I could never remember. That's an, a great case. Or just words like imminent, eminent. They're so close. And the, the vowel sounds in English are so subtle. That's the thing. You never usually call English a subtle language. But when it comes to vowel sounds, it is. And that I and E and E and E, uh, it, it, they're very difficult. Trying to help my husband learn English has made me realize how close our vowel sounds are there was just like three or four words that that have the h you know some have an h and some don't and that for for italians is difficult to hear they can't always hear that h and it was something like hear her hair air and those words are very close for a non-native english speaker definitely the e's and the a's as well because we don't really pronounce the vowel purely that's interesting part of living here and part of being an english speaker is and traveling the world is realizing the privilege that you have by the fact that English is your native language, just because it's the most commonly used. And so the likelihood that you're going to encounter an Italian in a restaurant that can speak some English is a lot higher than Italian has encountering a person who speaks Italian in America. Mm -hmm. And just these subtleties, these things that are really hard to learn, just to sort of know them by instinct is quite a gift. It is, it is. But I do have to say something interesting that I wouldn't have expected that comes out of being able to speak Italian is that my spelling in English has actually gotten better, I think. Because if I can't remember how to spell a word in English, if I know it's a Latinate word, necessary, for example, it comes from Latin, like the Italian version necessario. All I have to do is say it in Italian, necessario, and I can hear that the first sibilant is a C and the second sibilant is an S. Or separate. Separate is like one of those other killer spelling words that everybody misspells. The second vowel, it, 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 some people think it's an E, but I think it's an A. I can't even remember off the top of my head. But in Italian, if you know it in Italian, separare, you know that that second vowel is an A and it's not an E as we sometimes write it mistakenly. So that's kind of funny. That's great. That's a bigger incentive for me to learn Italian than even being able to do better at the grocery store. True. Go for it, then. <laughs> All right, so the final question. Oh, yeah, and this is another one for you. Which of the two languages is better, English or Italian? Which would you consider to be the most descriptive? Well, that is a very loaded That's question. That's actually two questions, technically. Well, I don't think you can say one language is better than another language. Not without making a lot of people angry. <laughs> I think you could say one might be more beautiful, one might be more musical, one might be more descriptive, one might be easier to learn, simpler, more complex. Oh, should we go down the list? Which one's I, more beautiful? Italian. I'm sorry. You can't deny that. You can't deny that. I'm sorry. And obviously that fits under the more magical. Did I say magical? Or not magical. <laughs> musical. <laughs> Does it fit under magical? I think they're both magical. Um, musical, though. Italian is a musical language. I think everyone would agree with that. I mean, that's why all opera used to be not just Italian opera, but German opera and opera from uh, in other languages, they used to perform it in, in Italian because it's got such pure vowels, as we were just talking about a minute ago, which, of course, come from the Latin, having also pure vowels. Which would you say is the most descriptive? I think English might be more descriptive, actually. English has more words. Italians never believe me when I say this. But English has something like 20,000 words. Does that sound like a lot? Sounds like a lot. And Italian has... 8,000 or something. Now, English has a lot of borrowed words. And English also has two root languages, German and, well, three, actually, if you think of really like the original old English, then you've got your German and then Latin. Maybe for that, it has more words. But I always feel like I can come up with about, and maybe this is just my lack of vocabulary in Italian, which very well could be. But I feel like there are always so many more synonyms in English than there would be in Italian. Now, having said that, I read with my little, very young sister-in-law, I read Harry Potter with her. And I learned... Her being Italian. She's Italian, yes. And it is... The, there were so many words that I didn't know. 
so many great descriptive ways to say said, for example. You know, that in English, you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds. And I didn't, ima I mean, I, I should have known there would be hundreds in Italian too. But so that was interesting. But I still think there are more words in English. And I think English might have just a little bit more of a pinpoint precision meaning. There are more English words for one Italian definition. Is that why you write in English? Because it's the more descriptive of the languages? I, I write in English because it's my native language. And it's just easier. Well, it's like a thousand million times easier. I don't, I can't imagine being able to write in Italian and having it be decent. Actually, you know, I wrote a poem in Italian. <laughs> now that I'm thinking it, I'm not a poem writer huh? at all. It was kind of a jokey poem, but I did. I did write a poem for my husband in Italian. Can we hear it? Oh, it's really corny. I wrote this poem for him one day when he had this really long work day ahead of him, several hours. And I wanted to send him a line of a poem every hour to help his day go faster. And so it was one of those things where you say C is for this, L is for that, with his name, Claudio. So I had all the letters of his name. This was before we were married, of course. Uh, yeah. This is all gone by the wayside. <laughs> yeah. no, no more poems in our relationship, <laughs> no. Uh, it did rhyme. That was what I was very proud of. But Italian's actually really easy to make rhyme. Because, for example, like, you know, there's three different verbs, the A-R-E verbs, the I-R-E verbs, and the E-R-E verbs, and they all rhyme with each other. Everything ends with an O or an A. Everything ends with a vowel. So Italian's very easy to rhyme, actually. So can you remember one line in particular that you really like? I can remember D e per il D in cui diventerà il mio marito, <laughs> which means D, the letter D, is for day, which in Italian, the old-fashioned way of saying day is D. D is for the day in which you will become my husband. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. Your husband here, he is a journalist, would like to be a working journalist if that's not his day profession, but he is a journalist at heart. And, um, and a journalist, in fact, in the sense that he has a, a, the Italian license, which is not an easy feat. Since he has this dream of going to America, which you are refusing to fulfill, <laughs> does that mean that he would prefer to be a journalist in English, if possible? He has toyed with the idea. His English is not good enough at this point. I don't feel that my Italian is good enough to be a journalist in Italian. So I don't know how many years that would take. He definitely likes the American style of journalism better than the Italian. Because in Italian, at least up until very recently, the way things are written is very wordy. It's too wordy. You don't speak the way that you write in Italian. Generally, in English, you write the way that you speak. And in Italian, that's starting to become a trend, but it hasn't been. You have a completely different style of writing. Not only your verb changes, your verbs change, when you're telling a story, you use this other completely different conjugation, which is the remote past, which I barely even know. You have to make everything complicated, and the sentences are unbearably long. The sentences are so long that sometimes it's an entire paragraph, and it's one sentence. And it's not, you know, some like Henry James thing where, you know, you get it. There's a reason behind it. It's like for no reason clause after clause after clause to the point that you do not even remember how the sentence began and what the subject of the sentence is anymore. It's full of that. So he's trying to get away from that and use the more American style of journalism, which is becoming more popular with the young Italian journalists. And it's not that they're getting paid by the word, say, like Charles Dickens. <laughs> he went on and on because word count needs to go up and up. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Didn't think about that. Generally, no. You're generally paid by the piece, here at least. Well, I don't know if we answered any of these questions. I think we, I did. Think we did. I think we did. What do you think, well, Adam? I want to hear, hear a little bit more from you, though, before we finish. You know, you hear a lot of Italian on the street. I think that a lot of what comes across in a language is not even the verbal part. There's obviously the, the gestures that, that Italians make, but also just the way that it sounds. Do you feel... There's something about language that the language you grew up with changes your personality. If you're Italian, it makes you louder or more musical. If you're German, it makes you more serious or more analytical. What do you think, looking at Italians, without being able to understand them? Boy, that's a hard question. Because I wonder how I would feel differently if I could understand them. Well, yeah, that's why it's so interesting, though. Because what I'm missing is the subtlety of personality differences. 
is her voice particularly charming? Can you not tell when an Italian is speaking charmingly? No, I think I can. But you know how, what I mean is that how certain people and how they talk really appeals to you mm -hmm. in your own native language for whatever reason, their tones feel warm to you or you really don't like how they speak one way or the other. And here I can't really differentiate. I can only differentiate who's loud, who's soft. I can pick out the sounds, but I can't say, does she speak with a particular lilt that's really annoying to people? I can't tell those differences. But they definitely do seem like a louder and bolder group. But that could be cultural. That doesn't necessarily have to be language. No, I think it's probably mostly cultural. But it might also condition personalities. I have a friend who has a theory that your name, you know, how your name sounds conditions the type of person you are. She said, if your name is Heather, you know, it's such a soft name. It's so whispery that Heathers are generally sweet, gentle people. But if your name is... Katie, a diminutive name, which is a it child's is. name. It is a diminutive name. It's very short. It's very, it ends with the E vowel, which is. Yes, it's a little bit childlike, Katie. And my name is actually Katie, K A T Y, not Catherine. It's just Katie, Katie Sewell. That's it. That's all I've got. Now, the only thing I could do to change it, and I think what my father at least was probably intending, was that I would be Kate as an adult. I don't know if he would agree that that's true, but most of my family calls me Kate. Most of my friends call me Katie. The main reason why I didn't become a Kate was because growing up, a good friend of mine was Kate. So there had to be Kate and Katie. Right. Rather, as you well know, since you also know Kate. Yes. So I never turned into a Kate. Kate. I never knew that. I think this is my own personal theory. I think you should go by Katie Eileen. I Aileen, sorry. Not Eileen. My middle name's Aileen. Aileen. Yes. Katie Aileen. Kateline. Kateline. Yeah. There you go. We just changed your name right here on the podcast. So I'm Kateline. <laughs> well, for today anyway. What does Tiffany mean then? I don't know. Tiffany is very, like when you say Tiffany, y there's a lot of breath there. Mm -hmm. But it's also not a soft name like Heather. It has a bold start. It has a bold start, but it's not like Lucrezia. Or something like really harsh like that. Yeah, it has a bold start with a kind of finish. Kind of soft finish, yeah. yeah. I like that. Okay. So I'm Kateline. And I'm Tiffany. And this is The Bittersweet Life. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, see you next time. Thanks for all the ways you support us. Give us a good rating on iTunes, maybe five stars if you like the show. It will help other people discover that we exist. Thank you. You're the best.